Hey everyone and welcome to the ASAP Kickoff 2020. And to all of you, wherever you are, thanks for taking the time to connect with us today because the world still needs more sustainability leaders. My name is Victoria and I have uh, many roles uh, in the founding organization Sustainages at, and as, at ASAP, but my one and only role today is to be your guide through uh, this uh, webinar. And um, I'm not alone, we have many partners um, and contributors who have gathered both here at KDH uh, campus and online because of you. Because we believe in every, in, in the potential and in, in each and every one of you. And our guess is that you showed up today to, um, because you want to develop as a sustainability leader. And our goal today, is to give you at least three things that you need on the journey. We want to give you an introduction to the five core competencies that we believe are fundamental uh, in, for any future sustainability leader. We want to try to give you a better understanding of the complexity uh, and uh, the beauty of the food farms and forests. And we also want to give you three things that you can do uh, already tomorrow. You've seen the lineup uh, on the um, event page and you've seen the schedule, but I just want to take some time to uh, introduce uh, our partners, uh, first of all, our um, charming and um, courageous partners. Uh, just checking to see because I can see the screen here, the PowerPoint screen. Anyway, we're happy to have our partners on board. We have LRF, who is the main partner of ASAP uh, this year. We have um, KDH, especially KDH uh, Sustainability Office, who's been providing us with this amazing space. And we also have Sustainergies with a lot of knowledge and manpower behind the scene. Uh, we also have our contributors from LRF, uh, Jens, uh, Emilia uh, and Peter. Uh, if we can show the contributors on the screen. Um, we have, uh, there we go, uh, Emilia Jens and Peter from LRF. And then we also have uh, for the next slide, uh, Peter Moorberg, uh, Kaushik and Charlotte. And these are both uh, the last ones. The two last ones are uh, former ASAP leaders from 2020 and uh, KDH alumni. I don't know about Frederick, we should ask him later. <laughs> All right, so the question now is, who are you <laughs> behind the screen? Um, and so since we're gonna use Mentimeter quite a bit today, I thought we would do a warm up. And some of you have already started, but I want to introduce uh, the ASAP Leader 2020, Kaushik, who's here with me. And he is gonna tell us some uh, interesting facts maybe about who's who's with us today. Gracious uh, yeah, introduction. So we have quite a varied background today. So sustainable development and environmental studies has the maximum percentage with 34% of the attendees being. And the next one is from engineering and technology with 28%. And those are the two most dominant groups here with us. Great. All right, I think there are going to be more people uh, joining us as we go, but yes. let's move to the next question mm -hmm. and uh, next Mentimeter question. And that is, what nationality exactly. do you represent? Okay, let's make the magic happen. Right, Sweden. <laughs> let's see what kind of country that is. Swedish, Sweden, Germany. What else do we have, Kaushik? We have Czech, Spanish, people from China, India, and Hungary, Dutch, South African, a lot of them coming in, yes. Finnish, Bulgarian. Azerbaijan, wow, French. Yes. All right, great variety uh, of nationalities represented. Um, 
I think we move on here and I'm, I'm really excited and proud to see so many of you here today. I mean, we're physically apart, but yet so very close in terms of what we believe in and what we strive for, uh, which is uh, accelerating the transition to a more sustainable society. But what are the key to success for the people that want to make this change happen? What are the core competencies? Um, that are needed to be successful, and who is the sustainability leaders? Um, at Sustainergies, um, we have more than 10 years of, ex of experience in, in, in doing matchmaking between young talents and organizations that want to drive this change. So we've thought about this question quite a lot. And uh, we've um, narrowed it down uh, to a definition of a sustainability leader that we would like to share with you now on the PowerPoint screen. Um, so this is our definition. Um, you might have another one. You can comment in the chat, in the Zoom chat, uh, or make up your own as we go. What's key here is that we believe uh, that it's not about having a formal position, right? So it's anyone and it's you. We can also move on to the next slide because still it's a very broad definition, quite fluffy, but in order to make it more tangible, we've decided to, um, or we've tried at least to narrow it down to five core competencies that uh, are maybe a little bit easier to understand and, and uh, also it's possible to practice these skills. So first we have a global and systemic mindset. This is all about the ability to always approach sustainability and, and the complexity from a systems perspective. This is fundamental and very crucial for any sustainability leader. Um, extreme collaboration skills. I mean, sustainability is the biggest team effort in the world <laughs> in history. So um, you have to be driven by uh, collaboration and partnership. And um, I mean, this skill has many layers, but what it boils down to really is interpersonal skills, uh, the ability to engage and inspire others, emotional intelligence, and so forth. Um, curiosity and critical thinking is the thir third one. And this is all about making your life into a continuous learning journey, right? To constantly learn new, reskill, upskill, and always ask my favorite question, why? But also, it's important to listen to the answer. Number four is courage. Courage because our world no longer changes in a linear, um, linearly. It's, we have an exponential change uh, in our world uh, right now. And in order for you or any sustainability leader to, to follow along, um, you need to have the courage to stick to your beliefs, but also to always adapt. Last, we have grit. Grit is a fantastic word in English. There is no real good translation um, in Swedish, as far as I know. But this is the, the combination of perseverance and passion. And in order for you to practice grit, we believe it's very important to go back to your own leadership and your own values. All right, so this is only a brief introduction. Uh, and I can talk hours uh, about this, uh, these competencies, but um, uh, but I can say, don't worry, uh, this is only the beginning. What I want to say is that you should stay with us until 3.30, because then we will reveal how you can make this session count towards uh, your future certificate for having attended ASAP's sustainability leadership training. So there are more steps to come, so stick with us. All right, um, I think I want the next slide. Um, and this is just to highlight three important, um, three important 
not rules, but maybe uh, ways of being <laughs> during today, I, I remind you of the third core competence, uh, curiosity and th critical thinking. I remind you about co-creation. Um, I don't have any answers, uh, all the answers, and neither do our contributors, but maybe someone in the crowd out there has answers. So freeze to use the chat uh, to um, help each other out. And also lead yourself and take responsibility for your own learning and what you need to stay sharp for two hours and a half. <laughs> all right, now it's time to invite our first um, guest speaker, and it is Fredrik Moberg from Stockholm Resilience Center. Um, so we're working with the LRF, right, the Federation of Swedish Farmers, and this is a theme that's incredible if you want to dive in to complexity. And so I thought uh, Fredrik should tell you guys why you should care about food, farms, and forests. So a warm a virtual hand to uh, Fredrik, please here. Yay. Thank you. It's great being here, uh, meeting you all. Uh, I am from the Stockholm Resilience Center and we sit at Stockholm University and try to find out the solutions to the grand challenges we have ahead of us when it comes to sustainability and the planet and so on. I also work for an organization called Alba Eco and we uh, specialize in sustainability communication. So my first slide, please. If you find it, guys. Some food for thought. Uh, it's a grand challenge also just to present this in such a short time. I want to sort of tell you why you should care about the planet, sustainability, and with special emphasis then on food, farms, and forests. So next slide, please. So it's going to be three insights all about the world today. It's going to be two pieces of advice and one promise. Next slide, please. So the three insights about the world right now are when I summarize sort of 20 years of experience working with the, the scientists around the world is that we have more people than ever on the planet. And actually more people are better off than ever before. So a lot of things are going in the right direction. We also know much more about the state of the planet and why it is so important to people. The living planet, why is it so important? And now, for the future, what we need you to do as sustainability leaders in the future is, of course, to have a new sustainable vision for both people and planet. And in this vision, I promise you, food, farms, and forests and farmers have key roles to play. Next slide, please. So first insights. There are more persons than ever, and more people are living better lives than before. Next slide, please. And if you guys could remove one of the squares that are sort of my wish. Oh, that would be perfect. Thanks. So since I was born in 1969, we have become twice as many people on the planet. That is quite amazing, actually. So next slide, please. And this is Hans Rosling. And he, in his Factfulness book and in his great lectures that you can find online still, although he tragically passed away uh, quite recently, uh, he tells us the story about things that are actually becoming much better on the planet for people. When it comes to lifespan and poverty alleviation, etc., uh, so many more people are living better lives today, but there are still too many who are lagging behind, who go, who go to bed hungry every day, and who are still not sort of living the good lives we want them to live. So things are going in the right direction. Hans was the best to explain why we should be more positive about the development in the world. Next slide, please. But we also know that much of this progress has come at the expense of the planet and that we now need to change course and become more sustainable and transform societies. But the good news is that we know more than ever about the state of the planet and why the living planet is so important to us people to continue that journey that Hans Rulsning was talking about that is so good. Next slide, please. This is my great grandfather, Jalmar, min gammal farfar in Swedish. When he left for America, he migrated from Sweden. It was 1909. 
It was on a steamship that was powered by coal. Next slide, please. So we look at this graph, how emissions from different fossil fuels have increased over the years since my great grandfather left Sweden. We can see that at that time, it was mostly emissions of greenhouse gases from coal. Now we have the other ones that are oil, natural gas, etc. And we have 10 times more emissions than we had when my great grandfather left Sweden. And I have another line here. It is when the internet was invented, 1989, 1990, approximately. And actually, half of the emissions from fossil fuels that we have emitted as humanity has come after internet was invented. Next slide, please. And we know the effects. Uh, right now, there's a lot of focus, of course, on a lot of wildfires in the Amazon, in California, Siberia, Indonesia, Australia in the last few years. That is one of the effects we see because we have uh, more severe climate change. Next slide, please. And at the Resilience Center, together with colleagues around the world, we have done a planetary health checkup for the first time 2009, then 2015, and there will soon be a new one out. So what is the state of the planet? And then we realize that it is more than a climate crisis. You can see here that climate change is outside the green area, the safe area for how much we affect the climate. We can also see that biosphere integrity, the loss of biodiversity, for example, is in the red. Land system change is outside the safe zone. And also the effects on phosphorus and nitrogen that causes nutrient pollutions in oceans and in lakes, etc., are way off the safe boundaries. And we know that food, forestry, has a key role to play here, both when it comes to having this kind of influence on the planet, but also if we change course, it can also be the key to success. Food and forestry can fix this. All right, so four of nine planetary boundaries have been crossed. There's an increased risk for tipping the planet into a much less hospitable state if we don't change course and become more sustainable. Next slide, please. So why do we need to care about the planet? This is New York 400 years ago and today, or a few years ago, actually. Next slide, please. This is a reconstruction made by National Geographic and a bunch of scientists. Next slide, please. We still need ecosystem services. We need nature as much as we did 400 years ago. Today, we, we live in urban life uh, with uh, high technology life, with internet and everything. We still need ecosystem services. Uh, we call them provisioning, regulating, supporting, and cultural ecosystem services. The services we get for free from nature. Let's just take two examples. Next slide, please. Climate regulation. The planet, the living planet, the oceans, the uh, agricultural systems, the forests, etc., soak up about half of the carbon dioxide we emit as humans. This is a huge free service of nature that has stopped climate change. It would have been much worse if we didn't have this service for free from nature. Remember that. Next slide, please. And bees, the pollinators, are contributing huge amounts to the global economy every year. And we tend to forget this. We still need to have good management of our natural systems to, to get the kind of things we want from forestry and agricultural, etc. Next slide, please. So, to uh, continue the journey that uh, Hans Rosling was talking about, the good development for us humans, and do that without uh, jeopardizing the planet that we still need, we need a new vision for both people and planet. And food, farms, and forests can have key roles in this. Next slide. We know we have the sustainable development goals. The global goals that the planet, uh, all governments in the world agreed upon 2015. Next slide, please. Uh, scientists at the Stockholm Resilience Center, together with Norwegian Business School, did a report to the Club of Rome, a think tank, a few years ago about what do we need to change to reach these sustainable development goals. And the three main priorities are these three. There were more in these reports, of course. I just summarize it now. No fossil fuels. We need to have emissions from fossil fuels every decade to fix this. We need better food. We need to shift to sustainable and healthy food production and consumption. And we need a circular economy. We need to transition to circular and regenerative economic models. Next slide. 
How am I on time, Victoria? Um, you have eight minutes. Good. That's really good. So let's continue. So the first one, the first priority to be able to transform societies to reach the global goals is to halve emissions every decade. This is Johan Rockström explaining this. You can find him on YouTube. The, what we call the carbon law or the exponential roadmap. Here we outline together with scientists around the world and companies, etc., how we can change course within different business sectors to half emissions every decade. It's called Exponential Roadmap. Uh, you can easily find it on the internet and follow the carbon law by halving emissions every decade. It's, we don't have more time right now, but you go in there and read it. It's a good read. Next slide. Food. Here we have worked with a commission together with Lancet, uh, the researchers at Stockholm Resilience Center, together with others around the world. Uh, the Eat Lancet Commission showed that we can actually find food that is good both for your own health and for the planet's health. Uh, it was everything from uh, halving the, in the intake of sugar, decreased meat consumption and, produ and production by a lot, I think we will come back to that later on and discuss that. It's always an interesting topic. And eat more fruits, nuts, and legumes. So by changing the way we eat around the world, it is actually possible to contribute in a way that we can stay within the planet's boundaries and reach the global goals, the sustainable development goals. That's the message of this report. Food can fix it. Also a tip for on your reading list. Go in there and read it and find it. Next slide. Okay, quite recently, just like 10 days ago, I think it was, the Living Planet Report was published by WWF. And we were uh, one of the research groups that contributed to this report at Stockholm Resilience Center. And we showed that to change uh, and bend the curve of biodiversity loss, you can see the black line here from 1970 to 2010, we don't want that to continue to be that steep, so we lose species at the same rate. We want to bend the curve. And to bend the curve, we can either go for the yellow line with good management of national parks, preserving species, etc. But if we really want to bend the curve a lot, we need to also go through a food system transformation. That is the key recommendation from this report. We need more sustainable production, more sustainable consumptions to follow the green line and truly bend the curve of biodiversity loss. Yet another tip for your reading list. Next slide, please. Circular economy. Everybody is talking about circular economy now. It's important in many different business sectors, of course, and for society at large. Here are two more tips for your reading list. The, uh, everything from Ellen MacArthur Foundation, for instance, Ellen MacArthur's book, uh, the report here from McKinsey on how much uh, economic gain we can get from a circular economy. And they came up with a number that was 1.8 trillion, trillion euros only for Europe if we go through this transformation and make the, the economy more circular. And the International Labour Organization has also estimated that we will gain some 18 to 24 million new jobs by 2030 in the whole world if we go this through these transitions to a circular economy. And the circular economy, as you know, it is about going from these linear flows where we extract resources, we distribute them, we consume them, and then we have a lot of waste. In a circular economy, waste is turned into a resource. And we also know it's important to reuse, repair, recycle, and share stuff in a circular economy. All right, next slide, please. Okay, that was really fast. Uh, <laughs> trying to uh, give you the summary of the state of the planet and what we need to do. It was basically three insights about the world right now. More people than ever, more people are living better lives. We know more than ever about the state of the planet and why the living planet is so important to us people to continue human development and reach the sustainable development goals. And we need that sustainable vision and food farms and forests have key roles to play. So now two pieces of advice and one promise and then I'm finished. Next slide, please. I'm right now in the middle of writing a book about biomimicry and biomimicry is so interesting because it's about 
being inspired by natural solutions to solve our own problems. Here's the kingfisher who has inspired this bullet train in Japan to decrease uh, the amount of fuel you need for this or the energy you need for this train, etc. And there are so many similar solutions out there. Ask Nature is a website where you can actually ask questions. How would nature solve this challenge that I have as an inventor or business leader? And then you get a reply from biologists and from their database. Janine Benius wrote a book 20 years ago that's called Biomimicry. Put that on your reading list as well. Next slide. We talk a lot about sort of why we should deal with sustainability and minimize the, the sort of bad effects we have on the planet. Now there's a trend to strive beyond less bad to actually become climate and biosphere positive. And that is something I would encourage you to do in all the context that you will end up in in the future. Challenge people to go beyond less bad to climate and biosphere positive. Okay, the promise, the last thing I do. I've met so many young people who work with sustainability issues and you need to be stubborn as Victoria pointed out. But it's so important to not burn your candles at both ends. You need to be sustainable with your own resources as well. So go out there and fight for a more sustainable planet and world, but be careful with your own resources and be kind to each other. That's the promise I want you to give me. Thank you guys. All right. Wow. Yeah, we're applauding here in the studio. <laughs> You know, there is a, an, uh, an applause function in Zoom, too. So if you feel motivated, <laughs> you can clap your hands, too, virtually. Uh, wow, that was uh, like um, uh. a crash course in sustainability. I think you had uh, 40 minutes last year. Yeah. And now I gave you 10. And I realized just a few days ago that I only had 10. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I mean, so there's a lot of things to um, uh, to talk about here, and you have some fantastic reading lists, and I make sure that we transfer those uh, readings and the PowerPoint maybe to to the students afterwards. Uh, but there, I've seen uh, some questions that have come up uh, from uh, from the students, and one is, uh, yes, but what about, what about politics? Mm -hmm. I mean, who's so you end up in this discussion about whose responsibility is it really? And so from your point of view, what's politicians' responsibility? What do, what do they, uh, should they do now to Ooh. bend the curves and so forth? They of course have a huge responsibility and we have huge responsibilities on sort of voting on the right mm. candidates, of mm. course. Uh, and there's so many beautiful words coming from politicians mm. right now in this in particular when it comes to circular economy and sustainability, and we have these sustainable development goals, mm. we have, after all, a climate agreement, etc. Mm. So now it's just about turning all these fine words into real action. Mm. And we as uh, voters and as citizens, of course, need to be active in that mm. and require more from our politicians than just fine words. But I mean, now the fine words are all there, so yeah. we can be there and convince them to put them into action yes. as well. So. And it's all about also closer co collaboration, like understanding each other's perspective in order to make, you know, policy changes that are actually um, functional. Yeah. Um, time is flying and um, I just, last question. Um, you had some very good uh, advice for the students, uh, for these future sustainability leaders, and one promise. Is there anything else that you would like to add um, as a, from like a personal perspective? Remember to have fun. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the tagline of my organization, Alba Echo. <laughs> Both sort of saving the planet in style and having fun in the process. Great. It's sometimes depressing facts. You need it's to remember plans. to put your eyes on the vision and that yeah. just communicating that we need to avoid the nightmare is not the way to go. We need to have that vision and remember that we have a dream of a sustainable future. Yeah. So more I have a dream than I have a nightmare. That's a very good advice. And then last question, last, last question. It's actually if you have a question for Jens. Oh, yes. Because we're going to deep dive now into food farms and forests. So Jens is looking a bit scared here in the studio, but I'm sure it'll be fine. But I know he's deeply involved in uh, a lot of things that 
are in the food sector. And I'm also involved in an interesting new prize that's called the Food Planet Prize. And we're looking for new innovations that can disrupt the food system so we can stay within planetary boundaries. So what's the most exciting new innovation you've come across recently uh, in this field? Hmm. That's the small question. And then submit it as one of the candidates for next year's prize. <laughs> or anyone. Uh of uh, all you students. Yeah. All right, so we'll give uh, Jens um, time to answer that question shortly. I'll say thank you, Fredrik, for thank joining you. us today. And um, yeah, keep up your good work and have fun. Thanks Excuse for me. me. Yes. Excuse me, yes. Um, and ask, we please? have a yes, voice. Please? Hello. Hello. Yes, may I ask, please? We take, um, you can have a, a question in the, uh, in the Mentimeter. I think it's easier if okay. we take it sure, that way. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, this is exciting. Uh, it's just, I think this is my first uh, webinar here, but uh, it's going good. Boys are working great there behind the, the cameras. All right, so now we've gone from understanding the big picture, what core competences that we think you should develop even uh, more. We've got uh, a crash course in sustainability, big picture, and we know that our ecosystems are at the f are fundamental to any um, to any good developments going forward. So now I want to invite. Jens uh, up on our little stage here and we are gonna have a short discussion about food farms and forests um, and I want to start by thanking all the the all the students out there I mean you've submitted amazing questions I mean everything from biodiversity to uh, future food systems uh, urban farming green gas emissions it's been very fun to read those and this is, has uh, also inspired our talk today. But we thought, talking about Hals Rosling, that we actually gonna start off by checking up on your fact knowledge. So go to Mentimeter again and uh, um, start to answer the first question. And you can show Mentimeter on the screen. All right, so First question for you out there. Um, how much of the water use comes from agriculture in Sweden? So out of the total water use, what's the water um, use that comes from agriculture? All right, Jens, what are you saying? Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. No, this is hugely interesting. It's great to see. I, I was extremely scared beforehand. I have to say that I've been sitting here regretting that I didn't do like Frederick and sort of prepared my presentation and I knew what questions would be like. But this is amazing. Um, oh, there's another question, including rain. Yeah, we usually talk about water withdrawals. So how much of water is moved from its natural course, so to say, into the human society? How large part of it comes from agriculture? And I can see that many of you have probably seen the global figures, which if you want me to, I can give you the, the answer to that is 70%. Mm. Should I give the answer what it's like in Sweden? Sure, go for it. Three. Yep. Only 3%. And this is updated facts from Absolutely. fresh fresh facts, okay. And the reason for that is that most of the water in Sweden, since it's, I mean, this is a damp country. Mm. We don't really like that in the summer, <laughs> but it is. And that means that we don't need to use, to take water from nature okay. to irrigate our fields. Uh, what falls from heaven is enough. Interesting, so that's a big, uh, good takeaway, right? Uh, start with knowing your facts, listening to Hans Rosling. Okay, next question. We have Mentimeter here, right? So we hear, and you have heard, that there is a lot of emissions from uh, agriculture and the meat is uh, meat industry, especially. So, what does the, what is the percentage um, of the total amount of emissions in Sweden? Uh, is this Sweden or globally? Just for me. <laughs> I think it's Sweden. You you go Sweden. I yeah. go Sweden. Okay. So out of the total amount of green uh, of emissions um, in the meat industry, 
how, how much is <laughs> how much emissions is from agriculture um that's also an extremely good question it's kind of tricky if you go by what the natural are natural uh, environmental agency environmental agency uh, says it's around 13 percent from yes. agriculture um so i saw figures there being up towards like 50 percent yeah, and that's so. kind of the rumors that you hear out there but it's 13 yeah. percent the way we count it today yeah in sweden in but sweden. isn't there a lot of uh, differences also in between countries and regions absolutely even? absolutely and that makes it so uh, and it also of course depends on what you do in your country if you yeah. have a heavily agrarian um, economy that mm. does a lot of agriculture mm. of course that part Remember. of the emissions would be higher exactly. so it's all right. Okay, so the last question, number three. Okay, so out of the total amount of food that we eat, how much do we import? So we have uh, everything from 30 to 70 to 50 to 80 to 60 percent to 30, 55, 24. It's very exact with 24, I feel. Like. <laughs> <laughs> 0.5. <laughs> 20 um, as well. I think they're doing pretty good on this one. Yeah, this is I mean, probably the best one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I, I, this is, you, you, you're, you're acing this around 50%. 50 to 70. No, 50. It, it depends. Uh, if you take all of it, it's okay. 50%. But then, certain, of course, of our, the coffee we drink in Sweden, 100% is imported. We don't grow it here. So, right. it's quite a difference depending on what sector of mm. food you're looking at. But on average, 50%. All right, so sometimes you think you know what the deal is, but then you look at the facts and there's always something new to learn. I think this is important to bear in mind. Um, first of all, the variety between different countries and regions um, and also um, <laughs> that is, it, it's, a, it's a complex system with different uh, components. Um, and we're going to come back also to the theme of like food security, uh, which has been um, you know, it's popped up as a very uh, central question uh, during the spring, especially. But first of all, I mean, there are um, probably a big amount out there who know uh, LRF as an organization, the Federation of Swedish Farmers. But I thought, uh, why don't you do your, a little pitch of who, who is LRF? Actually? Oh, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I'm part of LRF. <laughs> <laughs> but I have just been working for LRF for about a year, and I don't really know the organization that well because I've been so focused on sustainability. But LRF consists of about 130,000 members, and most of them are farmers or farmer-related. Mm. Some are. It's not so that all the 140,000 are farmers per se, but also we have some private members, but mm. a lot of them are companies. And I think the big difference between LRF and similar organizations out there is that LRF is almost everything that have their basis in sort of photosynthesis. Mm. So in many cases, you would have in one country, you have farmers on the one hand side and foresters on another. Right. To Sweden, we have farms and forests together. You would also have the, the, the primary product producers on the one hand and the food industry on the one other hand. Mm. Here, we're also joining this together. And that's it's not often what you see in the rest of the world. So I think we are an extremely big tent organization. We have the the companies who are absolutely on the forefront of uh, ecological organic production mm -hmm. and actually think that what's being done is <laughs> by, by the, 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 the mainstream ecological uh, producers yeah. is too soft, so to say. Mm. And we have others who are sort of in the other direction. So mm. I would say that we have, we represent almost everybody mm. that feels that uh, sort of using sunlight to bind carbon dioxide mm. and produce good mm. products is a good thing to do. Does that include the fishery, like aqua, aquaculture, like fish farmers, if that's Yes, absolutely. Word. Actually, one company that is a member and that actually LRF owns a stake in is Gård Fisk, who Gård Fisk. won this year's uh, Klimat, Bunde, Klimat. Climate Farmer Award uh, just a couple of days ago. So yes, but not the fisheries that go on out in the sea. We are land-based to a large extent. Land-based. Okay, good to know. Um, so a huge or umbrella organization, uh, a lot of different members doing different activities that has to do with the photosynthesis. What's the advantage and the disadvantages with such a diverse organization? What's are your, your strengths 
and weaknesses. <laughs> well, I would say the strength is that we are big mm. and we are a lot, so to say. And we have, and I also think one of the strength, strengths is that we have lots of heated internal debates. Mm. So we have to work with each other because not everybody thinks the same way mm. that if you're a farmer in the southern parts of um, sort of fertile plains in Sweden or in, in northern parts of <laughs> forested woodlands. Yeah. Those are different discussions. Yes. And it's excellent that we can come together, see two on each other, eye to eye, and resolve this before mm -hmm. we put forward the proposal so that we can speak with one clear voice, that this is the direction that we're heading in. Mm -hmm. And actually that was done, uh, it's been done many times, but one of the reasons why I'm in, at the Air Force that a year ago, or slightly more than a year ago, they decided mm -hmm. that yes, we are embarking on a mission to bring out sustainability goals and that's when they hired me <laughs> all right and you solved it uh, <laughs> I, I might have made a small contribution okay. but that's just one example of doing this together we need to work together mm -hmm. another example is that back in the 80s the first time when in the farming industry it was started to talk about we cannot continue to sort of feed our animals antibiotics just to make them grow faster. Mm. The first time that was raised as an issue mm. in the world, if I understood it correctly, was during an LRF meeting in 1982. This is now becoming the thing that the EU is doing as part of their Green Deal. Mm. It originated here because we can work together and you can have both the industry and the farmers talking this out and agreeing on moving forward. Mm. So that is a huge strength. The problem is it sometimes takes time. Another problem I would say, but this don't tell my members this, <laughs> is that they are, in a sense, sometimes too honest and very stubborn because they want to do the right thing. Mm. And they, I mean, when I have been trying to convince them, why can't we say this? They say, but you can't make sure that that will actually ha help mm. happen. And I was like, well, it's a vision. Can't we work towards this? That's not good enough. They mm. want things to be fact-based and solid and all that. So, of course, that creates a lot of credibility. Mm but sometimes hard work to yes. sort of maneuver them maneuver forward the and thing, getting obviously. them to agree that, yes, we, we will try and hopefully that's good enough. Mm. Um, talking about vision, you said, I mean, it's, I think it's important to, to have one to go for. And uh, you've been um, telling me before about your vision. I don't know if it's yours or if it's LRF as an organization, but it's interesting to, to hear also for all the uh, all students that are watching. What, what is your vision for the future? Well, I think that, as, like Fredrik just told us, one of the key things that we know that we want, have to do in this world if we want to become sustainable, using finite resources is not sustainable. It cannot be. So sort of taking things out of the soil that is, well, let's say below one meter. Mm -hmm. If it's potatoes, it's like 30 centimeters. If it's deeper than that, you should leave it there because those are often almost invariably sort of finite resources. If it's metals or minerals or oils, fossil right. fuels, they cannot be sustainable. If we're using them, we have to have a plan to move away from them mm. to something. And the only thing that if we see this as sort of spaceship Earth, we get one thing that comes to us mm. all the time, that's sunlight. Mm. So that we can use indefinitely. And we have to make the best use of that. And if you look at the world from that right. perspective, what you see is that using photosynthesis mm. to solve our problems has to be the way forward. Mm. So exactly like, like Frederick said, we have to move towards a circular bioeconomy where we produce the things that we need to satisfy our needs as well as all our sort of the nature's needs and people in other parts mm. of the world, their needs mm. uh, by using, and then in, I would say, cascades using, for example, wood could be turned into buildings where we store carbon in, in the, the building, but also provide us with shelter and all those things. When the house has served out, we can convert that wood into other parts, mm. other things like paper or clothes or, uh, and then we do that in cascading ways, recycling all the way down to when we turn it into energy. We burn that biomass of some kind, but we take the ashes out and that back to the farming or the forest so they can grow new trees or new vegetables and take the energy, power our economies with it, and maybe in a 
future when this hopefully will work, we use bio-CCS, carbon capture and storage, to collect that carbon and inject it deep underground so it can stay there and sort of clean the atmosphere. I mean, that's a kind of a world I would want to live in. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also a kind of a world that we all would want to live in. It won't be as easy as it is right now because it's extremely cheap just to pump oil. Sometimes you just punch a hole in the, that reservoir and it almost slows out of its own. So you don't even mm -hmm. have to pump it. That is not an option any longer. So I think we, that realization is what has to come into people's mind and see mm. what can we do with our bioresources mm. and what are the opportunities that we have. And we have to do this, and this can't not be stressed enough, while taking care of our ecosystems and our biodiversity mm. so that we don't sort of solve one problem, cause another one exactly. on the other and side. That was uh, one of my reflections and also one of the questions coming in for you guys. I mean, what are the limitations of the bioeconomy? What if we tomorrow would you know, turn all our products, um, you know, everything from fuel to clothes to, um, you name it, uh, from, from biomass, then we risk, you know, creating new problems. I mean, we've heard about the fuel versus food um, debate and also like removing uh, large amounts of forest uh, risks to create a loss in biodiversity and so forth. But what are, what, have you seen any, mistakes that have been done or any uh, like ethical dilemmas uh, that you have um, seen or that you are discussing in your organization? Well, oh, yes, of course. I mean, mistakes have been done all the time. We're, we, are, <laughs> we are humans yes. and that's for sure. But I think that what is important when we do mistakes, and I think that's also especially moving forward, is that we have to learn from them. Mm. So, of course, back in the 70s, there were lots of sort of ways by which we treated our forests that was not good mm. enough. Mm. And, but people at least learned. Mm. And today in Sweden, for every tree that is being cut down, at least two trees have been planted. I think the average now is 2.7 trees have been planted. So our wood biomass mm. has been increasing and increases a lot over the past mm. 100 years or so. So there are ways of managing this in a good way. Mm. I'm sure there are th ways to do it even better that than we're doing it today. Yeah. But I, I would say that today, if we look at, for example, every a forest owner yep. sets aside five percent of their forest for biodiversity purposes. We have actually been checking because one of the things that felt slightly odd to our farming friends was that people were saying that things are going so badly mm. in Sweden. And one of the things that are sad when it comes to biodiversity in Sweden is that it's not so much any longer what we do, but what we don't do enough of that is a threat to the biodiversity. So the ways that we used to farm mm. is not being used any longer because it's difficult, it's expensive and all those things and people aren't willing to pay for that food. Mm. Um, so that has meant that certain uh, sort of ways that we, in which we manage nature mm. is not there any longer. And that causes risk for those uh, species that live there. Mm. That's one thing. Another thing is that uh, sometimes a lot of what, is being done isn't really being counted because the only thing that are being counted is what we get support for. But then uh, there were some people working in the southern parts of the city in Halland that looked at satellite images and saw that compared to what's in the government statistics mm. and looking at what's on the ground in this district of Halland, they saw that more than 10 times more dams and wetlands were being created by farmers not being paid to do this by the government, but doing it all voluntarily. Why so, do they do that then? because it's good for nature. Because mm. these are people who live in, with, and of nature. Mm. They know that by hurting biodiversity, they are hurting themselves. We actually went out when we saw this and asked a lot of our members, mm. why are you doing this and how much are you doing it? Because when we look at the figures, we don't see this. So what are you doing exactly? And I thought when we asked this question that most of them would reply, the ones who are building wetlands, mm. that having the summer of 2018, when it was bone dry here in Sweden, mm -hmm. that that was the reason why they were building dams, understanding mm -hmm. that they have to protect their own future. The interesting part, over 60, I think it's up to 70% said that they're doing this for biodiversity or for wildlife. They're doing this for our sake, mm -hmm. because they are seeing that out there in the nature is not good enough any longer. Mm -hmm. So they're taking their own money, and these are people who often are not, <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, we'll probably come to that, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the hourly rate working mm. as a farmer in Sweden is not that good. Mm. But even so, they felt it's so important to do this yeah. to save biodiversity for all of us. Yeah. So I think that's a fascinating thing, but yeah. hardly anyone knows about it. We're mm. trying to write something about this so to make it more known. Yes, it would be, I mean, it's one part to, to 
tell tell the world uh, the, the the state and the fact yeah. and what people actually are doing. I think that's a really good thing. Um, I'm checking my time here, um, and uh, we're moving quickly. At least the time. Um, we have the questionnaires uh, for Mentimeter open, um, so you can feed your questions. As I said, our conversation is also based on all the questions that you sent in beforehand. And I, I think there's two questions that I really want to um, uh, ask you. And we talked about biodiversity loss as one of, of the biggest or the bigger challenges. Um, but what are, the, what are the challenges that you and uh, LRF sees um, you know, running up to 2030? What are the biggest challenges for Swedish uh, agriculture? I would say it's probably twofold. One is that to, to that image that we have of the future of being bio-based and circular, mm -hmm. we have to make that attractive. We have to want, have people wanting to live there. Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge challenge because the way things are going right now, it doesn't seem that that is so attractive. It's, mm -hmm. it's nicer to look towards a fossil fuel future when you can travel on holidays all across the world whenever you want to. But we have to fill that other future, make that Good so it's enough. a normative shift as well. I one. think so, in, in, in our own heads as well, as well as everybody else's. Mm. I also feel that when we look at what we have been doing in, in, in agriculture and farming and forestry in Sweden, compared to many other countries, we are mm. doing very well. I'm not saying that we're doing good enough and we will continue struggling here. But one of the things also when we asked our members, why aren't you, if you're doing this, or the mm. ones who aren't doing it, why, why aren't you doing it? They mm. can't afford it. Mm. And I think the challenge there is to see that we're doing a lot of good environmentally. Mm. I mean, just one figure, I don't know if it was shown before, but if you compare the land use emissions uh, globally, mm. it's 23%. 23%. I have right. been calculating this over and over again because <laughs> I can't really believe the figures myself. But if you would make the same exact same calculation for Sweden, yeah. it would be minus 230%. We are binding in almost three times as much as we are emitting totally in our biomass in the growing forests in Sweden. So we are doing extremely well compared to many other countries when it comes to uh, the ecological footprint of agriculture here. Mm. What we're not doing as well as on is the social part because many of our farmers are actually quitting their jobs and taking jobs in other parts Secrets, of the economy yeah. because they feel exposed to sort of threats and, and bullying from the other parts of society. Mm. They have chosen this work because they think they're doing something good for mm. all of us and they get bullied, they mm. feel. And of course, that is a sad thing. The other part is that many of them find that they cannot afford to continue work there and they cannot find somebody to take over the farms when they leave. Mm. So in Sweden today, we are losing around three farmers every day. That's one farmer every eight hours. Mm. And those are the ones who need to, under much harsher climatic conditions, under much more difficult uh, conditions, produce all the food, the fiber, the fuel, uh, the feed, everything that we're going to use mm. in the future. Mm. And if we don't have them, who would do that for us? So we need to make, I think, farming far more attractive. And I think that's why we are here. Mm. That's why we, I'm talking to you right. to help <laughs> me and to, to, to together see how can we make this a better mm. life? How can we make more people want to live in the future and want to work with farming? Mm. Because it's key for all of us. Mm. Yes, uh, we are um, exactly. And I think... Um, it would be interesting to follow up on also, we're going to talk with uh, two of uh, LRF's farmers later on, but like what are the different tracks that you can actually get involved? And um, yeah, how do you start to work in the green sector and in, uh, in farming? Um, there's probably different paths, but we can come back to that uh, later. Um, I think we have, we have a lot of questions and um, one is, uh, of course, about sustainable food. Um, and um, I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on this together with Peter and Emilia, um, our two uh, farmers that will connect soon. Um, but I, I, I have so many questions here, so I don't know which one to choose. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, we're talking about the SDGs. I mean, we have the Agenda 2030, um, and uh, 2030 is pretty soon. And there's a lot of discussions about organic versus conventional farming. And would you say 
that organic farming is an important tool in the toolbox to reach many of the goals in Agenda 2030. Absolutely. And I would actually go further than that and say that organic farming as one part, we have conventional, we have regenerative, all types of farming. And first of all, they're all labors because all the farm that you do is local. It mm. depends on where you live and what you do and what conditions exist there mm. and the climatic conditions and all those things and what you grow and what your knowledge are and all those things. So I would say we need everything and we need a lot of farmers to dare to experiment because the future looks very difficult. Mm. Uh, we have to do th certain things differently because the climate will force us to do it differently. Right. We might get... Uh, things, shocks, ecological shocks, where, for example, the birds might not come here any longer when all the insects are being hatched right. and all those things. So things are going to change a lot. Mm -hmm. And in order to find things that work in, an, in a difficult future, we probably need to spread our knowledge a lot mm -hmm. and try different things out and see what works when and how. Right. Because I don't know that, I don't think that we can foresee everything that might happen. So building on this broad base, letting a thousand or a million flowers bloom to see what might work in the future. Yeah. Absolutely. So there is no, it's not the silver bullet. It's one tool in the toolbox. Uh, ab I, I'm sh exactly. I think that this search for the silver bullet is probably dangerous. Mm. But we have to find out so many different silver bullets that help mm. everyone in doing their thing. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, I'm thinking about the question that Freddie, I've been thinking about it since he asked it. <laughs> what would be the most disruptive uh, food innovation or that I've seen? And I would first I thought, OK, if I can go back 10,000 years when we went from being hunter gatherers to be <laughs> doing agriculture, that was disruptive. Yeah. Uh, apart from that, I thought, OK, the Green Revolution in the 50s, it's been in sort of it's there are problems with it, but let's face it, it probably saved a million, a billion people's lives by stopping starvation, all those things. It mm. does have its problems, but some people have calculated that because we could intensify food production on the land that was already being used mm. some three times, we didn't have to cut down a lot of the forest that otherwise would have been gone. So it has been both uh, difficult from a biological or yeah. biodiversity point of view, but also good from another. Uh, finding the thing, I think that there are so many things, so many aspects of our food production systems that will change but mm. which one is the best one and will any of those change things radically i don't think so mm. i think that the low-hanging fruits were probably picked some nine thousand years ago it was ten thousand that we invented agriculture mm. and we have been perfecting this all along and we will continue to do this mm. i don't think that we should search for the solution but rather be very open to all the different solutions that on sort of small parts in different parts that if right. you can improve dairy dairy production mm. by having some algae that so you can feed your cows so that they don't burp up so much but methane. also maybe we can have um you know you can write in the chat all your students out there what's your best example of a disruptive food innovation that you've come across recently right we can gather that in the zoom chat and see what the students answer. All right, so now we're a little behind schedule, but I think that's okay. We're gonna have one last question from Kaushik, and then we're gonna have a five minute break and then meet with our farmers, um, Emilia and Peter in Zoom. So one last question from, for, um, for Jens Kaushik, because uh, Kaushik has uh, written his thesis on what you tell us yes so yeah my master's thesis was in collaboration with a company focusing on urban farming so a personal question from me would be to know is it how important is it uh, is urban farming for agriculture in comparison to the conventional methods being used right now and is a lot of members focusing a lot on urban farming mm -hmm. or is it predominantly only the conventional methods I would say within LF, I think most of them are conventional, sort of, if, mm. if that would mean not being in urban areas. Mm. But I think urban farming has, it's in so many different ways. If you look at urban farming as producing a lot of the food or the biomass that we would use, probably not that huge because uh, space is scarce in mm. cities and we won't often want to use them for other things. Mm. Also, if you grow 
things in cities. You have to bring a lot of other parts in. So we might have problems with our water supply in city. If you also want to grow our food there, that might make it even harder. On the other hand, there are things that where you can combine using city manure, so to say, to feed these plants of certain kinds. So I think, but maybe the best thing with urban farming is to bring nature and photosynthesis into people's lives and minds again. So that if you get people to understand how hard it is to grow, in not just having your own little <laughs> flower pots mm. in, in, in the windowsill, but actually growing food. Mm. It's a difficult thing. You would probably start appreciating what all the farmers are doing out there much more. So I think looking at urban farming as both a thing that could be very, very productive in certain parts of our food production system, but also as a way to expand our minds and understanding how important and how dependent we are on photosynthesis. I think that could be, those two together could make urban farming a hugely important contribution to the future. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. That quite answers my question. Cool. All right, guys, we're going to take 10 minutes. Yes? 10 minutes. Okay, they give me 10 minutes. That means I give you 10 minutes. <laughs> so um, we can, um, you can still uh, start to ask questions for Emilia and Peter um, and also for uh, Jens. I know we can make um, maybe Jens record some of the answers to some of the questions that have come in because uh, time is, is short. Um, but see you back here uh, in eight minutes now. So 10 past two, we will meet back in the stream. Uh, stretch your legs, grab a glass of water, um, do a little dance or whatever you need, and then see you in eight. Perfect. Thanks a lot.
Searching, looking all around For something I still haven't found The world's so heavy, it gets me down And though I may hurt sometimes I know I will be alright So I do what I got to do Whatever will put me through I put myself back together I put myself back together No, I don't want to be sad and blue even if I'm black and blue, I put myself back together. Cause I am blue, but I'm not broken. Damage, but I'm coping. Holding on and hoping. I'll find where I'm going. Blue, but I'm not broken. Took some time to own it. And though I may hurt sometimes, I know I will be alright. Blue, but I'm not broken. Damage, but I'm coping. Holding on and hoping.
shake, throw the weight in the dirt under me, yeah. I'm gonna shake, throw the weight in the dirt under me, yeah. I'm gonna shake, throw the weight in the dirt. All right, guys, welcome back. I hope you feel uh, a little refreshed. We've had some water and some talking uh, behind the scenes. All right, so we're gonna now move on to. Um, to a more, a little more narrow subject, uh, focusing on uh, future food systems, and we've gone from the big picture, sustainability, um, the bioeconomy with Jens, um, with a lot of questions that we will get back to you on somehow, and now we're gonna um, better understand farming in Sweden from a very hands-on and local perspective. So. Um, I'm going to see now if we have Peter Borring and Emilia with us uh, in Zoom. So Emilia and Peter, you can unmute yourselves and show your face. Yeah, I think, um, uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yeah, and, here. Yeah, and here is Emilia. Hi guys. <laughs> Emilia, I think yeah, everyone can see them apart from Kaushik and me. Yeah. But that's okay. okay. <laughs> but is it possible to see uh, Emilia and Peter? It's you're looking at it. Okay. So it's um Yep. Um so uh, I thought um we're going to start uh, again, fill up with questions. Uh, I have uh, uh, I have now moved on, or, or Kaushik has moved on uh, in the Mentimeter. So, top up with your uh, questions for yeah, for uh, Peter and Emilia. And uh, this is how it's going to work. We uh, are going to uh, let Peter and Emilia introduce themselves, and then. Um, we're going to fire away with your questions and maybe bring up some, um, some of the questions that you asked earlier. Um, so I can see, I see Emilia in the screen right now. Um, so please, uh, Emilia, why don't you introduce yourself and the very short version of your journey uh, and what the nature of the operations look like uh, where you are right now. Yeah, it's a big question at, uh, at once. <laughs> so my name is Emilia Stenis Swedeström. I'm uh, 30 years old and I am about to go to uh, take over a dairy farm uh, in the middle of Sweden uh, that is called Götene. Uh, we have uh, 365 uh, dairy cows uh, and in total at the farm we have uh, 900 animals with the calves and, and hoofers and so on. And uh, my vision for today was that I was going to, to have you with me in the barn, but um, it's a little bit rainy and a lot of wind today, so you probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be hearing me uh, that good. So it will be inside today. Um, I'm not grown up on a farm uh, from the beginning, uh, so it's a little bit special about this uh, gener re generation renewal uh, on how we are going to... to um, uh, lend over uh, the farm uh, to me uh, in a couple of uh, like 10 years um, and it's quite big farm we ha do have uh, robot milking um, and in total we also uh, have 900 hectares uh, and have um, what do you call it we use use crops as uh, where do I have my hair so we grow crops as uh, road beans uh, wheat, rye wheat, uh, rapeseed, and uh, we also take free harvests uh, on our grasslands that it's approximately uh, 425 hectares. And uh, of course, besides that, we also have uh, a lot of grazing in, uh, with the natural uh, nature value. Um, so uh, we deliver uh, like 22,000 uh, liters of milk every second day. And uh, the funny thing about the generation renewal that Dog was asking me last summer uh, if this was something for me to, to do. 
Um, what can I talk? I, I believe I do have some pictures. I don't know if, if we're going to show them now or if you brought them. Yes, we have some pictures uh, in the PowerPoint. We have one picture of, of the barn, I think. Yeah. Uh, and it's, I think, can you show that one? We're working on it. I think yeah. so. Yeah, that's a good thing. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so, Emilia, who, who's your customer? Uh, who do you our customer? Yeah, our customer is um, yeah the store. Actually, we are delivering to Ola, so every um, every little piece of milk is uh, uh, going to different types of problems, uh, problems, products, and we also are or organic and uh, connected to Krav. Uh, so it's like it's for cheeses, it's for yogurt, it's for uh, butter, and and so on. So we um, what do you call it? So it's different types of products that we deliver to. And we have mm. a little small amount that uh, is uh, bought by uh, private, uh, one private person that is uh, making cheese. Okay. But it's a very small part. What do you think, what is the best uh, and the worst thing about being a farmer? Uh, the best uh, thing is that you really um, are free as, a person to to work with nature, to work with the animals, and also uh, really, uh, what do you call it, seeing um, the fruits of what you've been working with. Um, it's a really nice experience to really work close to nature uh, in what you're doing. Uh, mm. The worst thing is, yeah, uh, nowadays we are having a huge discussion on uh, how we are affecting the nature and also uh, we are uh, yeah i think i uh, can um, sign up for jen's bullying thing mm -hmm. um, it's very hard to discuss um, how we're doing things in in a certain way uh, with customers uh, because uh, many times we are not in the room as a farmer mm -hmm. to, to discuss it uh, so you really what do you call it sometimes after uh, getting a point into the discussion. And it's really frustrating to do that. Mm. Mm. Right. Thank you, Emilia. We're going to come back to you with uh, more questions from the students. I think we're going to um, uh, give uh, Peter some space to do a little introduction. And here we have Peter. Welcome. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, uh, it's very interesting aims. to to be uh, able to, to uh, say some words here. I'm very happy to do that. Nice. So exactly, um, we're actually having the same question for you. I mean, can you tell us very briefly about your story, why you are where you are today, and uh, also the best and the worst thing about being a farmer? Yeah, I, I also had some pictures. I don't know if you got them too, but, but uh, I started, uh, my, my, uh, yeah, there you have it. On, my, um, on the pictures you can see uh, some of my views uh, that are my office views, uh, part of my uh, everyday job. Um, my career choice has never been uh, hard uh, or tough. I um, was uh, grown up on the farm, uh, uh, one of the farms I uh, grow today and I, I use, uh, and use today and run today. Uh, we had pig production when I grew up and uh, herbal production. Um, but uh, as I'm not that uh, um, animal uh, man uh, in, the, in, the world, in, in the context of having the responsibility 24 seven, taking care of animals and, and all the responsibility mm. that comes with that and, and the time pressure, uh, work with the animals independent if you self or sick or, uh, or <laughs> what day of the year uh, it is. I um, didn't uh, uh, develop that part of the farm. So today I only have arable farm. I run two farming companies. Uh, we are uh, in Östergötland now, uh, on the other side of, of the Lake of Vettern, compared to Emilia. And uh, it's about 250 kilometers southwest of Stockholm. Uh, uh, I run uh, my farm, 200 hectares of arable farm, but it's uh, on, I think I counted on what 50 years ago was 13 different 
farms. Now it's uh, uh, two uh, farming enterprises. Mm. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and what do uh, you grow? Uh, and what yeah. do you grow? Yeah, I grow. Um, uh, I, I have uh, two parts of what I grow: is uh, conventional farming in one company, and in the other farming company, I have an organic crop production, one third. And on the on the conventional farming, I grow uh, wheat for for milling wheat and for ethanol. I grow oilseed rape for for uh, energy and for uh, uh, oil for food or energy. I don't know when I sell it. Uh, and uh, I also grow um, uh, rye and barley uh, and oats and beans and peas. Peas. Uh, that, that's two, the two legumes I, I grow uh, as much as I can. And I, uh, and, um, I also have in my organic farm um, uh, the perennial uh, crop of, of uh, alfalfa, lucerne it's called in, in, in Swedish. And it's, uh, in, uh, it's my engine in my organic farm. I can come back to that later, maybe. So your engine in your organic farm was, I didn't get the crop. Uh, alfalfa, lucerne. Alfalfa. Uh, you can compare it to, to grassland, as Emilia said. Grassland, okay. Um, I think it's called Wall in Swedish, right? Yeah, yes. Wall only. Yes. I didn't want to so, uh, farm oriented. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe there is uh, someone in the chat who can explain what uh, VAL is. I know we have a great bunch of people from SLU who can maybe explain uh, the basics. Um, and what do you think, Peter, is the best thing and the worst thing about being a farmer today? Well, as Amelia said, what the best thing of being a farmer is, is uh, uh, following the nature's shift uh, over the year and uh, 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 see what you do you, you see the results of you do and you have to live with both the 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 um the good things and your mistakes and take responsible for that uh, every decision is not good and the months can get you satisfied and develop your your uh, experience uh, and also uh, produce something that you know that people want that is very satisfying uh, you know that people needs your products at least three times a day that's quite satisfying uh, so, uh, and also would like to uh, highlight one thing uh, that's not often said in those one thing being a farmer is that it's quite flexible. You can sometimes work all the time, but you also have a flexible way of combining as a uh, parenthood with small children and things like that and family. And that means that we don't talk about so much, mm. but it's very important. Mm. Great. Um, and the worst thing. The worst thing, yeah. <laughs> the worst he doesn't thing. have any think, worst things. <laughs> yes. Yeah, actually, I think uh, besides coping with, with, with changeable weather and, and, and broken down machinery, I think uh, the most frustrating right now as a farmer, I think actually that is uh, coping with, with every day I have, I have to cope with myself, handle myself frustration of, of that many people know much better than me how I should run my farm. And that is quite frustrating, actually. Mm. Mm. Right. I mean, thank you so much. We, I think we're going to stick with you a little bit, Peter. So hang in okay. there in the, in the screen. Uh, we've got some um, um, questions popping up, which is great. Uh, more for Emilia, too. But um, I was touching briefly with Jens upon what is, what is sustainable food, really. I mean, I think you can all relate to the to the fact that you go into the store and you have this apple from Sweden uh, or an organic apple from Italy and you're like, what's best? And the answer is very rarely an easy one. Uh, Jens, he always tells me it depends. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear your perspective, Peter, because you have told me before that uh, in, in 2013, you made a pretty a decision that was pretty much a big deal for you and it relates to organic and conventional farming. Um, can you please tell us about that decision? Yeah, I, I'm, I come to, to, to a point where I realized that I, if I wanted to, to be able to live, to take more of my living, uh, earn more of my living from the farm, I also teach a little at the agriculture college and I have a, a few other things outside the farm. I wanted to be able to more to live on my farming, business farming enterprise. 
then I have to do something to, to increase my income and my, my, my salary, so to speak. And uh, one thing could be to start with animals, but there was, you have to take much loans. And as I've said, I'm, I was not really fond of that responsibility that it is to having animals. So I thought that, no, I think props is the way to go. But then what kind of props? I can go potatoes on some of my land, but it's a very big investment. So therefore, I come to a conclusion that the easiest way to not invest a lot of million money um, and to develop my farm in a way that I can get a higher salary on, on, on my farm, that was to change over to, to uh, organic. Because by that time, organic was uh, pretty much more profitable um, uh, than conventional farming. And that was the easiest way for me to, to increase the value of all the crops that I grow on my farm. And uh, so I have to start at first uh, with all the economics to then outside and in, inside, outside, and see uh, how should this be? Uh, what com components did I have to transmit? And then I realized I have to have some puzzle parts to change. Mm. And one puzzle part was that I don't think you can ever have uh, long-term sustainability in organic farming if you don't have uh, a perennial crop like grass. Uh, in, in my case, that's alfalfa, but it's the same function. It's a crop that grows nice for three winters and you take three or four cuts per year. And mm -hmm. by that, you uh, um, uh, uh, can handle or uh, tough weeds, uh, that you can't manage with pests uh, and, fung uh, and then herbicides in organic uh, farming. And you can also, uh, um, that the uh, crop uh, rotation with the two, three years of this crop also uh, get to ground the soil to, to build up carbon and to, to uh, minimize uh, uh, nitrogen leakage during mild winters and things like that. So I think it's a very important part of, of, of organic farming. And I didn't have any animals to eat. So I had to, to um, uh, find some uh, who want to buy that. And I found uh, an industry who uh, bought uh, this uh, alfalfa, this Lucerne uh, uh, crop. So that was one puzzle. And the other puzzle was nutrients. What kind of, of um, uh, approved nutrients could I have for an organic farm? Because I can't just call and uh, uh, make a phone call and buy in them. It's very expensive. Uh, and then in this case, this was uh, biodigestive from a um, uh, circular economy here, uh, from our uh, waste, from disposal, from our, uh, we call it the green bag, from uh, the, the households, uh, go to lean shopping and they might buy gas of it and the rest of it comes to my and other organic farmers people. So that was two important puzzles, besides that the economy was better. If the economy hasn't got better, I have never switched over. Yes, because you, you said there was a pretty um, tough also mental shift for you because you've been against or, uh, organic farming uh, before. Why were you against it? Well, uh, I have never really thought that organic farming would partly function on my farm. I thought that I had too complicated weeds. So therefore I was never into it. Uh, and on system level, I thought it didn't deliver enough food. And some of my, my uh, things uh, and thoughts about organic has, um, uh, has uh, shown up been uh, not true. And other that I maybe even haven't thought of has been more than true, uh, both negative and positive. So uh, with the six years of organic farming, comparing those, these uh, ways of producing on, on my own fields, I have now some experience of it. Okay, great. Shall we, do you have a question for Emilia maybe to move over to her? Mm. What should we take? Thank you guys for all the questions. Um, can yeah. Go with this one. Emilia, are you with us? Yes. Yeah, so one of the questions the students want to know about is what changes are actually necessary to make farming more attractive as a profession? Because Jens mentioned that a lot of farmers were actually dropping out and it's one in eight hours. And so 
what should be done to make it more attractive as a profession. How do we recruit the 300 students that are with us today? <laughs> it, uh, it, it is fun. <laughs> Yeah, I can uh, totally uh, say that. And actually, if I look into my own story, uh, this is, was really a coincidence why I chose to, to uh, become a farmer. Uh, at the beginning, my vision was to become a vet. And then, therefore, I went to a, a special school for, for um, veterinary and, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, studies. But uh, in, the, in the same school, it was uh, for, uh, farming school as well. So I met my first cow there and I fell in love in some way <laughs> and changed, uh, changed my study to, to become a farmer. And uh, with that said, uh, I believe that when we are talking to our young people today, we are not talking that a far farming and, and, and uh, growing food is a, is a way of career you can do. Uh, that's one thing that we don't talk about that uh, the uh, career you can do. The other thing that is uh, the profit of it. Uh, even, the, uh, even though I think it's, it's fun and it's really uh, a tool for me to, uh, to, um, to um, contribute to, to a to, um, sustainable uh, future, it's still though the profit of it. I, I need to, to earn money to, to really uh, feed my family, but also to uh, uh, increase my own farming in, in investments as, uh, what do you call it, so, solar panels, for example, and, and um, uh, biogas stations and so on. So it's really uh, a, a lot of, uh, what do you call it, uh, pages on how we are going to get it attractive. And I think also it is uh, a, a way that we are seeing our farmer today as al also. Uh, we are seeing it like an old, what do you call it, an old person that is uh, going and just kicking in the ground and so on, that we are having a big picture that is totally wrong of what a farmer is today. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe that was my answer, yeah. a little bit of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we have another question for you, Emilia. Yeah. So while we are on the lines of profitability, as you said, which is very important to make it attractive, uh, where do you stand in the transition to make, uh, you know, to be a more vegan food for a sustainable future? Or are you actually against that type of transition? That's a hard question because I'm not against uh, any type of food, actually, because we need really a, a, a biodiversity in our food system as well. Because Definitely. if we are going to see at the system today, we also see the vulnerable when we are uh, really in need of um, water, for example, we are in need of uh, this type of land, we are in need of uh, nutrition uh, for the ground and the health for the ground as well. So that I don't see any conflict and it should be not be a conflict be between what we are uh, choosing to eat as a human being. We really need mm. to see the, the diversity in the food system. And today I believe it's a, a little bit too black and white discussion in what we are going to eat. It's, it's not that question we need to ask. It's how we are going to produce in the future. Mm. It's interesting. I think, um, wasn't there a Hmm. Some support from the banks. There's another quick question. Um, hmm. How many employees are you at your farm? How many workers do you both have? So, Emilia, how many workers do you have at your farm? Uh, we are nine people, uh, including uh, the far, uh, farmer. Uh, and uh, some of us just work in the, in the barn with animals. And some of us are just uh, out in the fields. And, and only one person has uh, been taking care of the, uh, the dinner for the cows. <laughs> so uh, it's yeah, a special person who's taking care of, only, uh, of the feeding. All right. So how many cows do you have, really? Uh, you said 900 hectares is the, like the area uh, of yeah. your operations. And uh, we have 365 dairy cows. And uh, with the recruits, uh, recruits, we are like 900 animals. Uh, that is uh, living in the farm. All right. So, would you say that's a large scale or small scale type of farming? Uh, it's quite a large scale uh, type of farming for uh, organic in Sweden. Uh, and we are seeing that uh, I think the uh, average farm today for dairy farms is 120 dairy cows. So, it's, we are quite big. Mm. But you told me before that uh, it could be bigger, 
that bigger yeah. is better. Is that true? No, it's not. I I, um, I, <laughs> I will really uh, take a point in. I don't. Uh, it is a necessary question to discuss how big or small it is. Uh, I always like thinking uh, about myself and my own farm and what type of print I do in my uh, in environment uh, and nature are among us. Um, I believe the discussion today also is to um, interrogate to how big or small a, a farm should be. And uh, it's not cooperate, cooperating with the nature, uh, um, nature that we are living in. It's mm. totally different if you see Peter's farm uh, against my farm. It's totally different types of farms. So mm. yeah, you should really think biodiversity in our farms as well. Mm. But what could be one of the, what's uh, usually, because um, the scale of farms is another question that we got like beforehand. What would be the advantage, the, the pros and cons of a smaller or a bigger farm? Um, I believe that uh, we can be that big because uh, a lot of farmers in our uh, neighborhood has, has been quitting. So we have been bought up the land mm. and uh, using uh, also the, the nature land, what do you call it? Uh, the natural pastures. Uh, we have like 200 hectares that is only like really having a biodiversity um, uh, big point there. Uh, we live by Shinikulle and it's a lot of birds and a lot of uh, different types of flowers that's only living there and it's really in need to having our uh, uh, our um, stock uh, grazing there. So mm. I believe that we should really uh, look at where do I live and how uh, are the possibility, possibilities to have a farm uh, instead mm. of how big or small it is. Yeah. All right, so we move over to Peter. Yeah. We can take the same question for you to start with. How many people are you, do you have working on your farm? Is it only you? Uh, I'm the only full-time staff uh, and uh, also have uh, uh, retired relatives as in many family farms and also have uh, hourly uh, paid uh, um, tractor drivers and uh, uh, also have seasonal workers uh, hand-picking uh, weeds in, during the summer. Uh, that's a very important part of my organic farm uh, mm. weed strategy. Wow. Kashik, we had a... Yeah, and you mentioned that for growing certain crops, you need a bigger investment, right? So what role does the government and banks play in supporting you in this, in doing this? Well, uh, if you take it by the bank and financial sector, uh, they can support me quite well if I can show that this is profitable uh, in the long run. Uh, that's, that's the easy short answer. Then it's no lack of money for good investment. So mm -hmm. uh, we're back to profit, profitability. The profitability for, now I'm talking Swedish farmers context, not global. Uh, for me, Swedish family farmer and for big scale farming like Emilia's, it's mm. the same issue. If we can be profitable, then we invest it back in our production. We build solar panels. If I could have more profitability, I would invest it straight in, in my land, in better drainage, liming, uh, and so on, long-term weed strategy, um, also we, and so on. I even might grow crops, some crops that are better for my crop rotation, but it's not uh, less um, profitable, profitable this year if I could earn more money in total. Uh, so better profitability for the farmer actually is very important for sustainability. That, that's uh, one of the sustainability issues we have to work with. Mm. So would you see um, what changes could the financial system or the banks do to help you out? Uh, well, yeah. Well, you, 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 were, you were also asked about uh, the government. I think uh, they, if, 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 I, if I'm sure that I have a long-term profitability, then I think this financial situation is not the problem. The problem is that we don't own enough, earn enough money long-term. These are big capital having a farm. If it's small or big, it doesn't matter. It's big capital. Investing in uh, special crops is big capital. So that is uh, the issue. Uh, and therefore, I think is, and I'll have this short, quick answer about 
how do you, but the food chain, how the value of the food chain is split up. That is, I think, is one really big issue for maybe policymakers and the government to look at because some parts of the food chain takes a bigger part of the value, an mm. unfair big part, if I would say. Mm. So, Jens, you had a comment on the financial aspect. We can't hear, Jens. He wasn't uh, looking at my rare parts. He was just turning on the microphone. I hope you can hear me now. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, uh, first of all, and when it comes to the profitability, just some figures from our Jordbruksverk, our farmers. Uh, uh, the Swedish Board of Agriculture. I, I checked my glossary before Perfect. I came Perfect. Thank you so much. No, they have make, make studies of, of what is the return on investment in the different parts of the food chain. Or, and when we look at primary production, it's 4.5%. Look at uh, f um, food industry, it's 12%. You look at uh, the grocery stores, it's 25%. When you look at the restaurants, it's up to 40%. So you can see there's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And the closer you are to the customer, the more you earn. And the further sort of back you are, the less you earn. But also, if you look at this, we have made some studies. Uh, Lant Menon looked at how much would it cost you on the loaf of bread in the store if you wanted to make it completely fossil-free in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And that loaf of bread would only be 50 euro more expensive. Mm -hmm. That's half a crown more expensive if that money could be sent directly back to the farmer. Mm -hmm. But since there's so many parts in the system that needs to sort of work through, it becomes difficult to do it. Mm -hmm. So, but if we could invest in our farming, that could make it far more sustainable. But now it's very hard for them because if you're running on that level where it's almost sort of the interest rate from the bank of four, four and a half percent, mm -hmm. it's extremely difficult to invest in your business and to improve. Mm -hmm. The other part, when we were looking at how much would it cost to make we have these large squares where you do certain things to protect the uh, bird life in your fields when you're plowing, when you're uh, cultivating your fields and fixing everything. How much would it cost to build enough of those, so to say, to save or to pr guarantee the long-term viability of the bird life of the, in our farming uh, areas? Only one euro per package of spaghetti. For one kilo of spaghetti would be one euro would be the investment needed if that could be sent all the way down to the farmers. So investing in the farming part of, our, of this chain is hugely important and not just to do it today to help mm. our farmers today, but also these are the ones that are our sustainable future. Mm. Without people like Emilia and, and, and uh, Peter. Peter, sorry, <laughs> I lost Peter's name, I apologize. <laughs> uh, we won't have a future. Mm they are key and helping them is helping us. Mm. I think that's the most important message here. But how do you then, how do you make it happen? How do you redistribute the, the profits or the, the returns on investments so it come closer to the, the origins and to the farmers? I think we need to have this discussion going on much, much more in society. Yeah. We have to understand that where we're putting blame and especially as Emilia say, where we are sort of listening to people and whose reality we are focusing on. Yeah. Because if people understood what it's like to live there and do that for a living, understanding that would make you appreciate it much more. And I think if you appreciate something, you would be willing to invest in it as well. Yeah. So I think that's hugely important. And I think that's why this discussion and having all this interest from young people out mm. there it's so heartwarming to me mm. because I think that together we can change this. Mm. Together we can actually make things happen. We can be that change that it's so important, mm. for, not just for us, but actually for the whole world, I would mm. say. Uh, it's great, in, great discussions. We have one also um, regarding um, um, new technologies. I mean, uh, in my in my feed on LinkedIn and so forth, I, I, there's so much about food tech. Maybe I'm a little biased right now, but food tech and AI and technologies. So there's also a question here from one student. Um, and we can take Peter first, for example. So what challenges do you as a farmer have to access new technologies that can help you in the day-to-day -day farming? Or are you already high tech enough? Uh, not high tech enough. Uh, I try to, to um, uh, uh, use as much high tech as I can. I have 
part of, of, of precision technology and GPS steering on tractors uh, for precision and things like that. Uh, but of course, we try to bend this more and more. Uh, but the, the, the quite boring answer in, uh, on the question is that economy and scale, and there, as you will see, big farmers has easier to invest in more environmental kit, environmental equipment. So that is also th this discussion of small and big farms. I think there are an upside of big farms, big, not much bigger than me, that are all often uh, overlooked in the debate that you can invest in, in better kit, better stables and all things, better environmental working conditions for the people who work, all this um, uh, is easier to achieve. And therefore you can see that bringing the high tech, the, the front part of the, the edge of the, of the farming, uh, the bigger farms are the ones who are in that edge and we other try to follow them. So to speak. Mm. All right, interesting. So Emilia, what's your perspective? I mean, you have pretty high-tech robots, don't you? Unmute, Emilia. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. That's You're so the disciplined. The technique. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really love high-tech because we are really using it in our uh, type of uh, farming production. Uh, uh, we are like analyzing how the cow moves by uh, electronic uh, necklaces that, that, that they have. Uh, we also uh, analyze their um, breeding skills by taking a DNA tests uh, on them. Uh, so, so really, we are. I, I really love high tech, and, and I really uh, would like to um, say, as Peter said, that all, of course we can uh, use all this uh, technique and all this uh, artificial intelligence, but it really needs to have uh, a, a good. Um, good place in our uh, planning and, and farming in, in, the, um, yeah. in the normal life. Uh, so uh, when we do an investment, yeah. uh, for example, when I, uh, I bought uh, some new necklaces for my cows uh, a month ago, yeah. and it was uh, an invest investment on, I think, half million uh, yeah. Swedish crowns. So it's a really a big amount and a really big, what do you call oh. it, um, sources that you need to, to have money to. Uh, mm. But uh, I believe there is a really big um, um, opportunity uh, for farmers to use more high tech, but it really mm. needs to, to be profitable still. Mm. Mm. Uh, Victoria, can I just yes. back, uh, come in there? There is one um, drawback with new technology, and I think that's for especially all the um, uh, young out there who are listening and uh, working, engineers especially, uh, technique is often not uh, adjusted to this environment. And that is, it should be work friendly, friendly used, uh, friendly users, uh, and it should be um, uh, sustainable, we, uh, reliable. We have a very special working environment. And that I think is very important to combine uh, edge technology with reliability. Because mm. if it's a Sunday and machinery broke down, then the technique is not any work. Then I have to, then I really uh, more rely on a cable than on a push button. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So it would be interesting. I mean, this is, um, so we at Sustain Energies, we sit at Norgen House in the middle of Stockholm, where there is a lot of food tech companies. And I'm just... Uh, maybe also asking for platforms where these these two groups can actually meet and understand each other better. Um, it's, I feel it's kind of uh, consumer or retail focus, focused uh, right now. Uh, but we have actually one example, a previous ASAP um, participant who's founded the company Volta Green Tech, who is using algae, 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 uh, for the feed for the cows to reduce the amount of methane that's emitted from the cows. <laughs> so, I mean, more, more of those would be interesting to see. Uh, oh, yes. So, we have... Um, uh, yes. I have one uh, question that I actually got before uh, from, from a student, and that is... Um, and this would maybe be the last question for, for you both. Uh, so, is your farm as sustainable as it can be? Yes or no, and why? 
Ladies first. <laughs> oh, thank you. Ladies first. Um, no, of, uh, I, it isn't because I have so many ideas how you can really do it more sustainable than it is today. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it's the solar panels, it's the biogas uh, facility. It's so much I want to do but cannot do right now, uh, one, one step at a time. And I think if you are asking uh, everyone that question, are you uh, as sustain sustainability, sustainable as you can? I think I I would really really uh, see that you are uh, saying no as well because mm. you can always do better. So what's what would be your next priority in terms of oh, improving resilience and the sustainability aspects of your farm? I would really love to like, like connect the solar panels because if you're uh, thinking about the uh, stables that we are going to ha uh, that we are having. Uh, with the, all those animals, you can believe the roof that we have for uh, solar panels. So mm. I would really lo love to have that. Hello. Mm. Yes, uh, okay. Uh, we muted Igor. Uh, we take him uh, in the Mentimeter instead. Uh, let's uh, go back to Peter, right? Yeah. Um, well, the answer is no. My farm is not as uh, sustainable as it can get. And my my first low hanging fruit uh, when the financial um, conditions are right is to solar panels on my barn. Uh, but if I could be totally um, uh, for, uh, free and self sufficient on energy uh, for electricity, that would be one step. The other part uh, for me, uh, uh, which is a lot, a bit more away, uh, I have uh, fought quite much in, on, in the political and policy, policy makers on being able to uh, enhance the speed to use uh, uh, fossil free fuels for my tractors. Uh, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the economic conditions now is that uh, the more fossil free fuel I use, the, the, the faster I have to run compared to my com uh, competitors in other countries. So. Uh, that is not actually, I'm going the wrong direction now, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And the, the other part I will do, as I told you, I would be happy to invest in, in uh, fertilizing the soil with more uh, uh, liming and so on. Uh, and uh, also, I would like to, if Amelia was closer, I would like to have a corporation so I'd have cows in my rotation on my farm. Because if I had cows on my own, uh, that could eat what I produce and produce manure. I would have um, organic manure in my rotation. So I would love to have cows as a sustainable, sustainability um, uh, solution on my farm. Mm. Uh, manure, if you guys don't know, it's a fancy word for cow poop. Yeah, which is important in for organic uh, <laughs> farming. Okay, so Peter, uh, last question for you. Um, if there is one tip or advice or s action that you think these future sustainability leaders should um, act on tomorrow, what would that be? That is actually to, to ask for uh, Swedish and local food. Uh, and uh, not only go to the local farm store, but on your local grocery store, your retailer, ask where it comes the food from in your uh, half product, uh, in your on the restaurant, where all this bulk of, excuse me to say that, cheap bulk volume import food uh, that comes from anonymous sources. We have to change the, build, the bulk of volume of food because that's where the most of us produce. And if we have a consumer direction that asks for more local, more quality food in the volume, then we will have a demand for more sustainable food. Thank you, good advice. Emilia, same question to you, last one. Do you have uh, any um, advice or tip for our future sustainability leaders from your perspective? Yes, and that's the fact that you are the sustainability leaders in the future. So I w will uh, uh, send you with you a question when you are really uh, take over the world, if, you, if you're going to say that. It is who do I include when I develop my thoughts? 
because you need everyone and every uh, type of sector to really participate if we are going to, to handle the, the uh, sustainability um, problems. We really need everyone. So who do I include when I'm uh, trying to solve a problem? Mm. Two very good questions. Where, where does the food come from and who do I include when I intend to solve any problems going mm -hmm. forward? Okay. <sighs> wow. Uh, we should have made this session like five hours or six hours, but now uh, it's time to move on. Um, and um, we have with us, if I'm not mistaken, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to both uh, Emilia and Peter. Having you here was great. Uh, I wish we could hang out more, but that'll have to be in another uh, setting. Because now I'm going to invite uh, Charlotte, who is also a former ASAP leader. She was part of the program last year. Do we yes, have Charlotte hi. with us? I am here. Can you hear me? No? Oh, yeah. You can't hear me? Uh, yes, no there she is. Uh, yeah, I, I hear you. I couldn't see uh -huh. you. Okay, you good. Many pictures. Okay. Um, great, Charlotte. I mean, uh, we're a little behind schedule, but we're taking our time. Um, so um, if you guys need to stretch your legs, do that. Uh, but stay because uh, Charlotte has some interesting stuff to tell you. So Charlotte, she was part of the um, the ASAP cohort uh, last year. She was one of the 18 selected ASAP leaders together with Kashik. And the funny thing is that they happen to be in the same class, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but we also have other people uh, that are not from uh, KDH. But Charlotte, um, I brought you on board because I wanted to take part in your um, brief reflections on your insights and learning uh, from working with Jens and, and, and uh, LRF uh, last year. So what are your uh, insights and reflections on that? And then also, what is some of the questions that you haven't gotten your answer to today? Uh, or answer that's at least satisfying for you? <laughs> So a reflection okay. and uh, a couple of questions for um, maybe mo mostly for, for Jens, because I think Peter and, and Emilia have left. All right. Yeah. So thank you for the quick introduction. And I'm really happy to be here. Uh, so as Victoria said, um, I used to be a KDH student and um, I was part of the ASAP team in January. And there I was on the group working with Jens and LRF on uh, some solutions we focused in the end on um, how you can make the choice for consumers in the supermarket actually more easy to, to choose the more sustainable choice. So that's what we dealt with a bit, but um, that actually brings me to my experience, um, like the overall impression of the experience. It was only four days. And while we had so much in there, it felt like we could only scrape the surface of, um, of, of what could be done and what could be said. And so it was very eye-opening in the sense um, that uh, these topics are so complex. And um, yeah, and for me, it was really interesting to deal with, with a topic that wasn't so close to what I did before. My background is not in agriculture. And uh, while you do know about the headlines that agriculture is a uh, um, responsible for a lot, a lot of emissions and a lot can be done there. It was very eye-opening to to hear from stakeholders in the field and work with them. Um, right, and I did bring uh, two questions that also are based on the experience um, that that I had. And the first one would be um, so these questions go mainly to Jens, maybe. Um, the first one will be about goal setting or monitoring or benchmarking the, the sustainability efforts that are going on um, and the provision of guidance that comes from LRF. So um, in the experience that we had during um, our four ASAP days, um, it was a lot about promoting Swedish produce um, and products due to the fact that they are already more sustainable and these, uh, what has been discussed as well today before. Um, but um, 
for us, a pain point was that the benchmark should not be to be better than others, but the benchmark should be should be set in science. And um, we have for uh, when we look at, towards climate, there are science based targets now that are being discussed uh, and the, what we what we heard about previously, the planetary boundaries. So um, in how far does LIF really work with enabling farmers to towards ensuring that you're in line with the science and while we have this nudge, this uh, this idea and the knowledge that it is already more sustainable, how can we make sure it is really in line with science and uh, the the sustainable development goals? Bam! Science-based targets. <laughs> Jens. Thanks a lot. I should not have agreed to this. First, thanks a lot for for um, taking part last year, and thanks a lot for a very tricky question. Um, no, we do work a lot on sort of what is sort of not better than others, but good enough or even sustainable, so to say. Uh, the problem there is that sustainability is not a state, but a process, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's something we will continuously have to work on. And one of the problems is that uh, sustainability since it has to do with economics, ecology, and social factors, they all have to work together. And since you can vary these in different settings, and also what is uh, sustainable environmentally in a certain place, in a certain period in time, might be different from another time. So one thing, or one way of looking at this, as sustainable is what stays. Some people have said to me, no, no, we were far more sustainable in the 50s, before the Green Revolution. Yes, then that could be argued, but if it was sustainable, it would still be here. Because people, it did maybe serve some ecological functions better then, but since it did not provide people with their social and economical, why, either as consumers or as producers, right. what they needed, that type of produ production is not here any longer. Mm -hmm. And we still have famine in the world. We had huge famines then. So looking at this and trying to say that this is the sustainable way, I, I'm, I would love it to be possible. I, I'm afraid that all those who say that these are the targets, but science is always evolving. So I would rather look at us that work with sustainability as maybe the forecasters. We can look at the trends, we can look at the science, we can look at the different forces and whirlwinds out there and make a guess towards the future, saying with the 60% likelihood, this is where we should be heading. But saying that this is the place where we will achieve sustainability, I wouldn't dare doing that myself. Mm -hmm. I would probably want to say that in this direction is where we should be heading. Mm -hmm. On certain issues, absolutely. Fossils, we should not be using them. Leave them in the ground. That's clear cut. Mm -hmm. But with the other parts and something so delicate as our ecosystems are and our biodiversity, the question there is, should we try to restore the ones that we have lost or should we try to pr provide space and opportunity for new yes. species to evolve into this new future that we know that we're heading towards mm -hmm. it's extremely difficult and i don't think that science has the answer there and even if you look at science you get 15 answers mm -hmm. so i think we need to be all of us knowing that this is we are amoebas in a sense mm -hmm. trial and error but hopefully with some type of guidance. But what about your, because um, uh, LRF in January, just when you were working with Charlotte and the team, you were uh, adopting your sustainability goals for LRF as a whole uh, organization. Um, did you have any um, clear cut and, and hard targets uh, in those or what are those sustainability we have goals. some we have some okay <laughs> and and the easiest one which is very very hard but the easiest one was fossil free because there everybody agrees the problem there is that we know that if we are the only ones going fossil free we will be out competed because if you compare just sweden to denmark they pay five, five euros for every liter of fuel they use we pay over three crowns in sweden even with sort of subsidies and stuff like that so we will be out competed if we only we do it and that was the hard part for people to agree but they said that even so we have to try this we have to lead the way here we did it with the antibiotics we have to do it again even so that was very hard when it comes to the other parts for example we know uh, the, the 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 methane that the cow burps how can we solve this without hurting the biodiversity how can we do certain things there we had to say that we need more science we need more knowledge we need to work on this and find the right ways of moving here uh, so where we felt that we could be safe and secure enough in knowing that this is the right path right. we took it 
but whenever there was this discussion, we had to be more careful in saying we need to invest far more time and effort into finding out. Mm. All right, Charlotte, are you happy with that answer? Ish. <laughs> But I think we don't have the time to, to go for much, much further into, into this, but it uh, should be but kept in mind. Uh, um, exploring, yeah. And uh, please on the chat, yeah. what, what do you think are the, you know, the, the pros and cons maybe cre around science-based target? And um, do you have any tips for LRF? You can write it in the chat. You had another question, right, Charlotte? Yeah, exactly. So besides highlighting this importance for, for having um, tangible benchmarking and monitoring, I wanted to go a bit more into um, a fuzzy question in a sense. So um, if I were to be the bad person here and I were, if I were to ask you, wouldn't you say that maybe LRF with such diverse um, members uh, with um, different types of farming has a conflict of interest in itself as a business organization or an interest organization in terms of promoting sustainability. I am um, now kind of going towards this. So we have the dairy and meat farmers and we have the ones that are maybe producing oats for oat milk. Um, and there, there are some tensions. An example is a lawsuit of the LRF Mjölk division that has sued Oatly for using some terminology. So you have tensions even among the, among the members. And um, as Frederick was stating in the beginning, change in the food systems could bring about this sustainability shift that we need or the shift towards it. So um, how is that being handled? Um, to have these kind of conflicts of interest among among members and how can you really promote sustainability in that sense? Well, I think the great thing there, and I hope that, I mean, they have all come together and said that we are moving in this direction towards sustainability. It was a hard fight. I wasn't there when it happened. So I, I, I was hired afterwards to, to make it happen sort of in, in reality, but the decision was formed beforehand. And just that, that all of them together said, we need to move in this direction. I think that's one of the things that sort of is a clear answer to if, if and if there are conflicts of interests, there will always be conflicts in a big organization like LRF. And people will think, for different reasons why we should be heading, but that's just like society. And what is the best choice in certain situations? Uh, I think this work method of actually trying it out, discussing it and having all the parties that are within NRF at the same table mm. and working this through is a strength, not a weakness. The only strength weakness is that it might take too much time, so to say. But I think also in building that understanding and building that uh, force of working together, it's also something important. I, I was thinking because I was asked before, what kind of advice could you give to, to the people listening? And I think an important thing there, it sort of came to me because I have that in my bookshelf next to where I'm working, the book of Daniel Kahneman, thinking fast and slow on how our minds work. It's a great book, you should read it. But looking at that, I thought we should act fast, think slow and be careful because we don't know everything all the time. And we have to be able to try ideas out and work through this and also build that momentum. Mm. So in order to act fast, I think we need to think slow. And I think we need to do this together and have everybody around the table. And it's good to have them, it, in a safe space that it's one organization because you you we disagree a lot maybe not openly but oh yeah we do it internally <laughs> believe you me mm. do you have any comments on that charlie right. um yeah i wanted to even push a bit a bit further into the direction that also some of the questions in the comments went towards like this I think maybe a lot of us in our bubble group here are vegetarian or even vegan, and there is the proof that this is um, that that this is a big factor in working towards sustainability. So this conflict of interest that I was referring to is how can LRF, um, as an organization that includes meat producing or or dairy producing um, uh, farmers. Um, advocate for these kind of shifts because really you can't because you also represent those so mm. that is what i was going for a little bit more how how would that 
to put it drastically, hold you back maybe, or how can you engage with with those farmers? Um, I mean, Emilia also stated that it was um, it was very important to have the diversity to also have have cows in order to to have the um, nutrients for uh, crop farming and these kind of things. That for sure, but but the facts are there that we need to reduce our meat and dairy consumption uh, and so how does that uh, how is that a, a pain point maybe in the organization that you can't really argue against this well i think it's not really uh, well of course it's difficult some farmers would feel personally attacked like you're telling them that they're bad persons because they're producing meat mm -hmm. that would be difficult for anybody to hear that you're a bad person so to say so i think but as long as you avoid that, everybody's open to a discussion. And the, the, I would say maybe this is, goes against what I was saying before, but some of our farmers find huge consolation in knowing that we're far better than all the alternatives. So even though it might be so that we as a global population would have to reduce our, either reduce our meat consumption by 75%, according to the World Resources Institute, or increase the uh, climate uh, efficiency of meat farming that's 75 percent and then they look at figures globally and saying that we already at around 70 percent better than the global average in sweden so we're almost there when the whole world has to be so if any meat farming needs to go we are probably the ones that should go last and since people tend to want to consume meat and dairy products it's better we produce it for them than somebody else where it might make a huge detriment to the biodiversity if you cut down rainforests and other things so i think this can be discussed because we're not in black and white we're moving in these shades and as long as we can work with these issues and knowing that yes for climate change there's one question but we also desperately need to work with biodiversity and there the same cow is the savior uh, so all how to work in this together. I don't see that as something as holding us back, but rather enriching the discussion that the whole of society should be having. And what are we doing? How are we using our lands, our soils, our forests and everything to create as good a future for as many people as possible on this planet? Great, thank you. Um, Victoria, did you want to add something or do you have one last um, thing you asked no, me to I mean, prepare? Uh, right. Uh, I think all the contributors, they remember the questions better than me. No, but uh, same for, for you as for all the other um, speakers, like what would be your top, um, top number one tip or suggestion for all the people and people or students that are listening today um, in order to develop sustainability I mean, leadership <laughs> i am the same age as most people here um so i don't know how much wise advice i could give but i'm just based on on the experience um in the asap program that i got to have this uh, january i would say one big thing that i learned that i would um, want to give people to take home is um that I'll connect it to a saying. I think in English it goes, everybody just uh, puts their trousers on one leg at a time. In German, we say, everybody just cooks with water. And the point that I want to make with this is that um, previously I used to think, oh, there are all these great minds that are going to solve these problems and they're going to take leadership and that they're going to do these things. And I just feel very small. And the point is that you have to be one of these great minds there's like we are all just human we're all just facing the same problems with this with the with the one brain that we have and um so it is um yeah that's to remember every time you you think oh nay i'm not going to apply for for this position or these kind of things so yeah just uh, to see yourself as this potential leader i hope it wasn't too fuzzy after all uh, i love that I got goosebumps. So Likewise. that means that was a good ending mm -hmm. of your uh, intervention, Charlotte. Thank you. Um, Thank we, you. as you might have noticed, uh, skipped the break. Um, and uh, I think we should keep going. Uh, my colleague is nodding. Um, we just have a few minutes now to actually um, try to 
recap and wrap up what we've been experiencing so far. And um, I think we have a slide uh, which says the end of the beginning. <laughs> and um, this is our time to sum up, uh, focusing on, on three things. Um, first of all, uh, reflection, uh, then recap, uh, what you can do tomorrow. And then, of course, number three is how do I take the next step with ASAP? And how do I make this session count towards my uh, certificate this fall? So I want you to take, first of all, one minute to write down on a piece of paper or your phone or uh, talk to your friend at home. What is your takeaway from this session today? So we've gone from talking about five competences uh, of a future sustainability leader. We've met Friedrich, who's outlined the big picture of the state of the world today. We have talked to Jens and Emilia and Peter about different perspectives on um, agriculture and food and farms and forests. Um, and then uh, we ended up with uh, Charlotte's message to you all. So what is your main takeaway? I'm gonna go silent for half a minute so you have time to write it down. And then I'm gonna bring in uh, Mentimeter into the screen. Now we want you to pick up your phones, just a short, um, a short, a short check uh, in Mentimeter. What did you find most valuable today? And um, We have leadership, real farmers was a good one. Clarity, farming, perspective, mm -hmm. advice. Yeah. Charlotte, that's cool. Charlotte, <laughs> she's a good girl, yeah. Um, perspective is pretty high up there. You're already a leader, that's right. That's where you start. <laughs> Innovation, discussion, inspiration is pretty pretty up there. Facts from Jens. Good work, Jens. Holistic view, insights. Well, as uh, I used to say, and I think Jens agrees, if we can say after today that, oh, this was not enough, I haven't got any, uh, like all the answers to my questions, then we've done a good job because that was exactly the intention we had with today. So, um, Keep being curious. We're going to send some, some of the readings and facts that were mentioned. Um, LRF homepage is also a good start. Um, we'll get back to you with more reading materials. And now, Kaushik, I'm going to yes. invite you to... Um, we've been hearing a lot of great advice mm -hmm. uh, from different speakers and contributors. Can you help me? <laughs> to recap because i don't remember them yeah i think starting off frederick mentioned that it was important to have fun and not just focus on saving the planet but saving it in style so <laughs> so it's it's about having a need to dream about a sustainable future right. but having fun while doing it so that and was then you need to f like um, what do you, how, how do you believe sustainability is fun for you? I mean, we all have, have our different ways of making it fun. What's important for you? For me, one of the main reasons why I took up sustainability as a program was to learn more about the actual changes which I can actually make mm. with a, in collaboration with organizations mm. while uh, being able to see the changes which are taking place in the society around me. Mm. So I think sustainability actually lets me do that and mm. i'm grateful for that so. cool so one tip yep have fun the next one is 
Um, about Swedish and local food retailers. So Peter mentioned it was important to source local food and mm. focus on that. So yeah, go around to your retailers, your grocery stores, restaurants, ask them for local food. Mm. It's really fun, actually. I'm starting to do that myself. You know, where where is the food produced? And you kind of get all sorts of answers. It's really fun. So really, they had two questions mm -hmm. that you should ask always. <laughs> who do I include in my solutions, right? Mm -hmm. And who who made this food and how? Absolutely. Uh, did we have anything from Jens? Yeah. Jens mentioned one of the tips was to read the book, Thinking Fast and Slow. <laughs> yeah. And on top of that, acting fast, but thinking slow. I think that's a very good point to take home with us today. Mm. Yeah. Good one. Um, and then we have uh, Charlotte. Yeah. What did she say? Uh, so it's important to be a leader, but you know, you're not always supposed to look outside for right. those bright minds, but you're supposed to be one of them. So mm -hmm. I think that that's actually gave me a little chills. So yeah. mm -hmm. I definitely agree with Charlotte yeah. there. So. Do you have any advice for them? Hmm. It's a very tough question. <laughs> I mean, it's tough to beat all of these answers which have come in so far. But um, yeah, yeah, I think it's basically about having the willpower to do what you want and persevere until the end. I think mm. that's one of the five key yeah. points of the grit. Yes, exactly. Wonderful word. Mm. So it's about having that grit to go until the end and being able to do what you really want to do, mm. which is in this case saving the world. <laughs> I guess that's why all of us are here, right? Mm. So. Let's do it. <laughs> Great. My suggestion, my suggestion, advice to you, it's an advice that I got from another person. Uh, his name is Johan Kielenkrana, and he is part, he's in the, new, the news report, like he's part of the, he's commenting on climate and sustainability issues in TV4. Um, and he's a researcher at Stockholm, Stockholm University. He said, in order to work with sustainability, you need to understand humans. And I think this is a very important takeaway. Uh, Jens was touching upon it too. How can we make change if we don't know how to manage and how to understand us as human beings and how we function and why we make decisions and so forth. So that's my, that's my um, message to you. All right, so now we're switching. Uh, we can actually switch to the last slide because now the moment has come. Um, this is the slide you've all been waiting for. No, but we've been, um, as you might know, the, the spring has been a little bit challenging for a lot of organizations and so is the case with ASAP. So we've, we've been both planning and doing uh, at the same time. But now uh, I'm going to tell you how this session, this webinar is the first step out of five in order for you to receive a certificate of completion for having attended ASAP sustainability leadership training. So this is the first module. After this module, and uh, there will be four more different tasks to complete in order for you to get your certificate. And once you have completed those five steps, uh, you are qualified and able to apply like Kaushik and uh, Charlotte did uh, to become an ASAP leader of 2021 and uh, the ability to go deeper into these questions with a focus on food, farms and forests. So what you need to do after this session is that you need to fill in the evaluation form that we sent out. This is the way that, that you can collect uh, one point for uh, participation today. And if you have friends uh, or um, oh, fr friends or family, I was going to say, but mostly like friends or peers um, that are not able to attend the live session here and now, there will be an opportunity to um, watch this recording afterwards um, and also receive the same point. But you guys 
who are here and who send in your evaluation right now, you will have, um, uh, how do you say, you will have an advantage in that you will get the invitation to the next step as, uh, as the first one. Um, mm -hmm. So from another cliffhanger to the next, um, but anyway, we're gonna wrap this up now. I uh, want to say thank you to all of you guys out there for having, uh, for being here today to, with us, for asking smart questions, for helping out um, with explanations in the chat and so forth. Uh, and I want to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Lucas and Jasmine and Daniel, who's been doing the camera work. And I want to thank Tuve, uh, who is from LRF and sitting behind the screen here, and also Jens. And of course, Kaushik, who's been with me. Um, all day and you have the uh, contact information to to me and my team at the bottom of the last slide um, that I'm going to give you it's asap at sustainabilities.se um, feel free to email us if you have any questions and uh, we will also let you know how you can get um, more answers to some of the brilliant questions that you handed in. We'll be, we'll be discussing this with uh, Jens uh, and LRF and we'll get back to you because there's a lot, a lot more things that can be asked and that can be answered. Um, with that said, is there someone who has a question uh, in the chat maybe? Have you the possibility, Lucas, to see if there's a <laughs> the evaluation form would come within an hour, right? <laughs> yes. All right. So there's nothing about the, the next step or uh, the process. Anyway, so we will follow up with more information on the next step uh, soon. And we will also follow up with uh, some of the, the slides and the recommendations that were um, talked about here. Um, I think that's us, right? Yeah, so I think one of the last things I want to mention is that I definitely want all of you to go ahead and you know, carry on with this process of becoming an ASAP leader. Because for me, it has been a wonderful journey so far. and. Uh, even though once upon a time, beginning of the year, I didn't think I would actually get into this program. Mm. Having gotten in, it has actually made me push myself to my limits. And I should definitely thank all of the organizing members here for giving me the opportunity because mm. it's been a yeah big, wonderful journey for me. Mm. So I'd want the same for all of you guys. So please do go ahead and go on with this process and earn the five credits you need to become an ASAP leader. That's all for us. Yeah. Thank you very much and have a good weekend when that comes. <laughs> See you. Thank you.
searching, looking all around for something I still haven't found. The world's so heavy, it gets me down. And though I may hurt sometimes, I know I will be alright. So I do what I got to do, whatever will put me through. I put myself back together. I put myself back together, no why? I don't wanna be sad and blue. Even if I'm black and blue, I put myself back together. Cause I am blues, but I'm not broken. Damage, but I'm coping. Holding on and hoping. I'll find where I'm going. Blues, but I'm not broken. Took some time to own it. And though I may hurt sometimes, I know I will be alright. Blues, but I'm not broken. Damage, but I'm coping, holding on and hoping, I'll find where 